All right, so we're on the second page of the PDF notes number 14 on tomography and uh, the Lebras uh, reflection tomography, and then what I call the Born inverse here. Uh, Born is probably a uh, German physicist from 100 something years ago. Um, he uh, worked with um, particle scattering cross sections, and um, we apply his um, his theories to um, to our seismic scattering problems. <clears throat> so this is a direct tie-in. Uh, actually, uh, you know, looking at the Born approximation here. Um, uh, this is a direct tie-in to particle physics. It's a direct tie-in to um, uh, Feynman's theories. Um, you could make a Feynman diagram out of each of these terms, and we know we know uh, them as ray diagrams, right? So you start at a source. You have a uh, Green's function which carries the uh, energy to a uh, scatterer, and then there's an interaction. Uh, uh, a virtual source, if you like, at the scatterer v, uh, and then there's a uh, another ray that <coughs> carries the uh, the wave to a um, uh, uh, to a receiver, and uh, that's exactly a uh, Feynman diagram. So um, this is uh, a great crossover between uh, modern physics and uh, and geophysics, uh, and you can see as we uh, as we go on in the Born approximation, um, we get uh, <clears throat> more and more um, more and more uh, complex Feynman diagrams, if you like. Um, so uh, uh, we can start using some of the the simplifications that the particle physicists have as well. And uh, our first one is is uh, um, is really uh, uh, this that um, you know this might be a uh, the second term here might represent a Feynman diagram, of course with a with a reflection, and um, as Feynman says, uh, you know each Feynman diagram is one possibility. And it has a certain likelihood, and of course that likelihood is is given uh, in our case by the reflection amplitude that we see. Okay, the stronger the amplitude, the higher the likelihood of that uh, of that scattering. So this is a scattering uh, potential here, and the um, uh, the reflection amplitude that we see is really the sum summation of you know, each of the Feynman diagrams for all of the possible scattering paths, all of the possible interaction points, all the possible reflection points. And I've already taught you that those points are lined up along a, an ellipsoid, a revolution in three dimensions. And so that's really just another statement. Kirchhoff migration is really just another statement of Feynman's insistence on adding up all of the possibilities. Even though they are, um, uh, you know, an individual possibility may not be likely, you have to add up the probabilities of all of the the different uh, potentials for scatterers. So, um, um, and and this is uh, uh, this is something that that we as as exploration seismologists uh, have a pretty easy time getting our head around. Um, but the earthquake seismologists really have more trouble, um, at least the average earthquake seismologist, um, who may work, uh, you know, on one path, you know, for a whole project, um, and they're they're only used to dealing with the, you know, the Fermat minimum time path or the uh, the specular reflection, for instance. Um, and, and suggesting that they also ought to add into the, the, the possible amplitudes the amplitude of the forward scattering, the amplitude of the, uh, 
the scattering at unequal angles of, of incidence and reflection, right? All of that is uh, is included as well in our Kirchhoff migrations. Why did you choose the? Um, I think that's probably uh, Clayton and and Lebra, um, trying to make their uh, um, their math look a little bit like the physicist's math. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I might, I might rather use R, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but they also, you know, they want to say it's a scattering potential. It's a, it's not a uh, reflection coefficient uh, yet. You can derive the reflection coefficient from it, but uh, the scattering potential is something different. Gotcha. Okay. So what we're doing here. Um, is we're launching into a discussion of what I could call reflection tomography. And um, how am I defining migration as tomography? And what's going to come out is a, a very um, kind of a very, uh, it's, it's simple, but it's also kind of non-obvious, at least the first time I saw it. The um, um, well, I've already defined tomography as a uh, uh, as using the uh, um, using the the uh, uh, diagonal only of L transpose L for simple earthquake travel time tomography. Okay, mapping say p n velocities that sort of thing. All right. Now uh, we're going to go into this in, in great detail, and uh, you know maybe uh, I, I'm rushing things here by putting this you know one of the most complicated applications of tomography first before I, I go in and explain the mathematics of, of tomography more carefully and give you more of the simple examples of uh, of tomographic approximations you know applied to all kinds of different things. You know, filtering, deconvolution, all all those, you know, things that we haven't we haven't looked at since seven oh six. All right, so maybe I'm jumping the gun, but I you know I wanted to to get this uh, uh, you know Clayton and Labrasse's uh, work. I wanted to get that out in front of you as early as possible because I know you guys are working with uh, these kinds of migrations and you're concerned about amplitudes. You're concerned about uh, Structure and and uh, the uh, assumptions of the uh, the, recon the image construction. So uh, you know we have defined then that you know here's the forward problem, okay, and under the tomographic approximation here's the inverse problem, and what Clairbout is going to say uh, you know all through the PVI book is that. Um, this is the, the tomographic approximation. Really, is that you know taking the off diagonal elements of L transpose L to be zero, it enables you to very effectively and very usefully um, approximate the inverse of L. Right here's the forward problem. Um, we want to come up with an inverse uh, process that's going to give us an estimate of M. Given some data d, right, and under the tomographic appro approximation, what we're really doing is we're approximating the um, the inverse with a transpose. Okay, so really, what's what's involved here is the fact that a um, a uh, uh, um, Um, a, a, the multiplication of a matrix by a column vector, say L times M, is really a series of dot products. It's really a series of inner products. Can you say that again? Okay, the, the multiplication of a matrix by a column vector, it's a series of in, inner products. It's a series of dot products. Right? You, uh, you dot product the, uh, the transpose column vector by the first row of the matrix, and that gives the top element of the data. Uh, then you move it down. You move the uh, 
the model uh, vector down one row and dot product that. That gives a second element of the uh, of the data column vector and so forth. Okay, and and note that the transpose right. It's it's again, you know, L transpose applied to the data is just another series of dot products, and the dot products are composed slightly differently. Okay, and and you know you 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 would have thought that all of the work would be done you know by this D inverse, but really all the work is done by the transpose and the the dot products the inner products that that defines. So really what our tomographic approximation is going to become is not necessarily um, just that the off-diagonal elements of L transpose L are, are zero. What our tomographic approximation is going to become is that we can use the, tr the adjoint multiplication or the transpose multiplication as an approximation for the inverse of the forward multiplication. Okay, so that means that however we we care to define an inner product, <clears throat> and uh, uh, you know down here in in this uh, Born approximation, you can see it's written out in the frequency domain. So that means that there are you know integrals involved at least in terms of putting say our source wavelet and our our Scattering potential and our Green's functions g, you know, putting those into the um, um, into the Fourier domain that takes Fourier transforms. So there are integrals, and you can define integrals that function as dot products that function as inner products. Okay, so really, it's this it's this feature. Of as Clairbaut calls it, processing versus inversion, you know, adjoint operators instead of uh, uh, inverse operators. That's really what's going to carry the tomographic approximation to our uh, our work in migration. So um, okay, and and so we're going to have an operator, and here I'm expressing it as a uh, you know, as vectors and, and uh, matrix, um, but we're going to write it out as uh, as integrals. And I'll show you what the uh, the transpose of the uh, of the operator uh, multiplication is uh, looks like when it's um, uh, when it's when the the inner products are represented by integrals by integrations. Okay. So, um, and as you might think, you know, if we're able to write out the forward problem, then writing out the transpose more often than not is a very simple business. <clears throat> and especially, you know, we're going to define dot products in a in a way that uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, make it particularly. Simple, and, and you're going to look at it, and you're going to say, "What? This can't work." You know, just like we did in tomography. You know, we're we're uh, we're ignoring the correct units, and we're ignoring the correct scaling. Um, and yet, it's a it's a brilliantly elegant solution. It does work. We really can ignore the inverse, and the and the scaling. <laughs> Uh, that's right. That's right. Um, so, uh, um, uh, but it, it the, you know, this is a, a concept that's uh, you know all through particle physics as well. You know, due to Feynman, Born, um, uh, and and all their all their predecessors. So, it certainly works very well for them. <clears throat> okay. Now. Uh, I'm going to also uh, show you once we're once we're through all that. I'm going to show you uh, Christoph Stork's work on the SVD of a uh, of a migrate of a velocity uh, inversion coupled with a uh, uh, a velocity tomography coupled with a migration. Um, and in particular, we're going to look at those. Uh, you know, we're going to examine the velocity structure ambiguity, 
and what's, what solves it, what doesn't solve it. And we're going to look in, in terms of, I'll show you some of those eigenvectors that are unconstrained. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I, I think, I think a, a brilliant piece of work. OK. So uh, uh, you know, I can give you a copy of uh, Labrosse's thesis. I, I wonder if it's available in the um, ProQuest system that you can get to. You know, you, you'll be able to get all of your theses uh, uh, a year from now. What's that? You can't get Caltech theses. Oh, really? Oh, man. OK, well, I have a paper copy in my office. So uh, if somebody wants to scan it, let me know. Um, he also published a paper later on. But um, uh, the, uh, some of the best stuff is only in the thesis still. So, um, uh, and Ronan was my office mate, uh, so I, I got to see him, you know, uh, had the privilege of, of seeing him uh, develop this. Uh, so uh, I, I just think it's really great, <clears throat> and I'm happy to use it. Um, Ronan showed that, that both the acoustic and the elastic wave equations, um, he could reduce them to essentially Kirchhoff migration back projection methods. Okay. Is first name or something? Yeah, okay. yeah. He's a, uh, a Breton. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, he still works on um, 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 test ban treaty uh, seismological uh, projects in Vienna. So. Uh, you know, got a very, uh, uh, very nice lifestyle. <laughs> um, and um, all right, so if you if you're willing to take these these uh, these assumptions, okay, then um, uh, you can uh, you can re you can approximate effectively approximate an inverse to even the elastic wave equation by Kirchhoff migration. Okay, so uh, you need the tomographic approximation in the way I, I just described, as uh, you know, adjoint uh, uh, um, inner products um, instead of inversions. Um, you assume that you have far field observation. Okay, in other words, your uh, uh, and that may be uh, uh, another thing that we need to play with with the uh, Santa Medio migrations. Is the uh, min, the minimum time, the min time, uh, because right now I had it set to zero, which means we're migrating in stuff that's that's right at the sources or or right at the receivers, um, and that's not right. Um, you assume, um, um, oh, who is it? Williams, somebody, Bolin, Jacobs, uh, wave propagation. Which is basically raised traced through a model that's not too crazy. So, um, if it's uh, if it's a velocity model that is um, smooth enough to to uh, uh, support Vidali's original code, then it's uh, uh, the ray approximation is not too far off. Okay, and so then the WKBJ propagation. Um, is that's the kind of the condition on it, okay? So we we certainly push hard against that one, um, but that's how we uh, that's how we do our 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 downward continuation for this migration. Uh, you know, we use uh, we use ray theory, and um, uh, so that's uh, that's uh, one one easy way, okay? Um, and then the Born approximation. Uh, which was uh, 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 above, but let's uh, let's take a look. Okay, so let's uh, let's set it up. Uh, consider an acoustic medium that's described by incompressibility k and density rho. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna make the uh, medium uh, linearized. These are uh, so-called uh, asymptotic assumptions. Okay, and what we're headed for here with the, with the Born approximation is is the assumption that we only have to pay attention to the primary reflections. 
that the, the secondary reflections, the multiple reflections, are going to be small. All right? That's really what's behind the Born approximation. Okay? So, so it's taking the, the, the one or two component, well, the, the one component or the uh, three component um, Feynman diagrams, the, the, you know, the single, the no interaction or singular interaction Feynman diagrams for our problem, and throwing all the rest away. There's no two interaction Feynman diagrams. There's no, there's no 50 interaction Feynman diagrams. Of course, we know that's not true. Every surface wave that we record, you know, has has infinite interactions essentially, um, <clears throat> but we're going to assume that uh, uh, that we don't have any of that. All right, and so to assume that, we're going to take these asymptotic assumptions on the medium, um, on the cross section, on the uh, as it'll turn out on the velocity and density. So we have k is equal to our reference uh, incompressibility k naught plus delta k. Uh, the density is uh, the total density is equal to a reference density plus a density perturbation delta rho. And delta k is much much less than k naught, and delta rho is much much less than rho naught. When we are migrating in Santa Medio from that data set, I mean we have. Um, our density variations, uh, well, they're less than a factor of two, but our our incompressibility variations are a factor of ten, at least, maybe a factor of fifty, right? Because the velocity variations are the square root of the of the incompressibility variations, right? Um, under this uh, acoustic assumption, um, so that means that uh, uh, no way. Do we have delta k much much less than k naught? All right, so we're we're in trouble already, but uh, um, let's see how far we can get with this assumption. Okay, now <clears throat> we're also going to put some spatial constraints on our uh, on our medium. We're going to say that the reference model, um, which is k naught and and rho naught, they vary slowly. In space, in x, y, and z. Okay. Yes, even in z. Okay. So uh, uh, we're going to trace rays through our reference model, if you know, to do the uh, WKBJ approximation. And for that, we need, uh, um, you know, we can't have uh, true velocity uh, uh, steps, true k or or rho steps. All right. So the reference model is slowly variable spatially, um, and what does that? What else does that mean? The reference model does not produce reflections. Okay, the reference model varies at a scale, uh, and and slowly enough that for the band limited data that we're looking at, we're not getting reflections from the reference model. So if you ran a um, a synthetic, you know, a synthetic uh, survey across the reference model only. It would be reflection free. It would contain direct waves only. Okay, as as you're thinking, gigantic assumption. All right, and and definitely not true at Santa Medio. Okay. Um, all right. Now, where do we where do we get the reflectors? All the reflections, all of the re, all of the scattering potential, is due to the much smaller delta k and delta rho. All right. Um, so uh, um, you know, and, and here's where uh, you know, with respect to wavelength, and, and Tim Stern uh, last year and I, we 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 scratched our heads over this uh, a lot because um, uh, we were working at a um, um, a problem where he had seen the uh, the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary uh, in a uh, amazing data set he has. Uh, of uh, twelve explosions set off across the uh, um, across the uh, the lower neck of the North Island, and um, monitored by uh, what was it 300, 400 Texans, uh, four hundred uh, you know single channel vertical receivers, and there's reflections in there from hundred kilometers down. Okay, and uh, they're at uh, I think 
like 14 hertz, which means that the, the gradient has to be as sharp as the wavelength. So the gradient has to cover a distance, a depth interval of less than a kilometer. And you know, it's just it's really astonishing to find anything that deep in the mantle that is um, sharper than a kilometer in its uh, in its change. <clears throat> you, you you know you just wouldn't predict it from from heat flow from convection in the mantle. You just don't predict things that are that sharp. So um, if we're able to get a, a paper into uh, Nature Geoscience uh, on that basis, uh, well, we're trying. We'll see. Um, and so we had to we had to figure out uh, exactly who said first that uh, uh, you know you only generate a reflection when the uh, uh, when the spatial variation is um, uh, over a distance that's uh, uh, that's less than the wavelength. We we had to figure out who's who actually proved that first. Um, okay. Um, the uh, <clears throat> um, so here's an example of a well log. You know this would be uh, uh, velocity versus depth. Okay, and if you've ever, I'm sure you guys have looked at well logs, and uh, uh, probably this is uh, you know not as crazy as a lot of well logs you've looked at. Okay, so we're going to take that total velocity signature, and we're going to break it down into a smooth reference model v naught. And then on top of that, we're going to add a rough um, uh, uh, delta delta v, a rough perturbation. Okay. So notice that the the uh, the perturbation is centered at zero. You know, there's as many uh, negative delta v's as there are positive delta v's. Um, but the reference model is uh, you know it's it's definitely uh, uh, all positive. Okay. <clears throat> so here's the uh, 2D acoustic wave equation, just like in 706. Okay. Uh, but now we're in including a source term, and this is the xz and omega domain. So we have um, um, uh, omega squared over k. Plus uh, uh, del dot one over rho uh, applied to uh, uh, del applied to uh, and then uh, the, both of these operators here are applied to uh, p the wave field. Okay, that's the subject of our of our uh, wave equation here. And then uh, the source term instead of being equal to zero, we we set it equal to a source term. So there's a uh, a delta that depends on the uh, on the source location, uh, there's a delta. Uh, these are Dirac delta functions, right? They, uh, or maybe they're maybe they're more like Kronecker deltas. Um, they, uh, uh, um, you know, they they just that's what uh, shows when the wave arrives, right? Depends on the depth difference, and then there's the uh, source wavelet in the omega in the omega domain. Um, you know, which might be a correlated vibrosized wavelet, or it could be the the sharp ringiness of a of a hammer blow. All right. Um, so the source is at uh, x s z s, and um, and uh, the uh, um, we got the source uh, the Fourier transform of the source time function. Okay, that's big S, and. Um, Let's uh, pull out of uh, out of the air the linear operator. Um, uh, you know, well, actually, we're just going to call this thing in brackets L. Okay, that's the L. Whatever it is, you know, and here it's in it's expressed in the Fourier domain. Okay, in, in omega, but it's in uh, in z. So whatever that uh, these are spatial derivatives here. Okay. So um, that operator is L, okay, and that's equal to here. Uh, what's up in the brackets? That L is applied to P, and then um, um, you know I'm not saying it's a matrix; it's just a linear operator. Um, 
and then here's uh, uh, the source term on the right. The solution to this is a Green's function that is the inverse of L. Okay, so the Green's function is uh, minus L inverse. Okay, and um, you can't get that Green's function analytically for a laterally variable medium. For in one dimension, you can write down the uh, Green's function um, pretty easily, um, and hopefully you you have done that. Uh, you know, one dimension constant velocity. Uh, hopefully you've actually done that in the past, um, but uh, for a uh, and for a vertically variable medium, you can um, um, uh, you can you can uh, make it. Uh, it's a, it's it's complex, but you can you can create it. Uh, but for a laterally laterally variable medium, you can't write it down very easily. Okay, now what W K W, K, B, and J did is, uh, oh, J is probably uh, Jeffries. Yeah, yeah, Harold Jeffries, uh, Bullen. Uh, K may be a Japanese fellow. And uh, W, I'm not sure. OK. Um, so for a, a slowly varying reference model, now notice here I'm giving uh, I'm giving some elastic uh, um, uh, parameters here. You know, we've talked about uh, the reference model uh, rho naught. We've talked about k naught. And if you want to go into uh, the elastic world, all you need to do is add mu naught. Okay, um, with the which is the rigidity. So you need a uh, a model for rigidity as well. Um, and the and the WKBJ approximation. Uh, is an analytical solution for uh, um, for uh, wave propagation in that slowly varying uh, uh, reference model, and so um, the uh, the Green's function for the reference model then we're going to call you know from a source to a receiver um, through that slowly varying reference model that Green's function we'll call G naught. Okay, big G naught. Okay, so now from uh, from particle physics, the Lippmann Schwinger equation states that the general propagation Green's function G, you can you know for the whole the whole data, okay, you can find in terms of G naught. Okay, so the exact Lippmann Schwinger equation for all scattering, okay, is um, uh, it is like this. Uh, the full G is equal to G naught plus G naught applied to, uh, and this is a going to be a scattering potential, right? This is the difference between the uh, this is L minus L naught. So that's the difference between the full um, Earth model and the uh, the reference Earth model. So what's the difference? Well, that's the deltas, right? The delta rho, the delta k, and, and now the delta mu. All right. So uh, uh, that's uh, that's what's what we're going to call the scattering potential. Okay. And then and then look at this. All that acts on g. Okay. So this is not a uh, an equation as you're used to seeing. This is a um, this is a uh, a recursive equation. The Lippmann-Schwinger equation is is recursive. What is G naught? G naught is is the uh, is the Green's function, which which you there is a WKBJ. Um, um, it's a WKBJ uh, analytic solution for a a reference model that's slowly varying. Okay, so it's basically ray propagation. All right. Well, so so um, uh, you know, here's here's the recursive equation, right? Yeah. And um, so uh, we gotta we gotta to to solve this, right? Because um, we don't know what g is. We're trying to get g, right? But here's g in the in the equation. So we substitute this in and multiply it out, right? 
<clears throat> right, right. So you know the first the first two terms are going to be g naught plus g naught l minus l naught times g naught, right? And then there's lots more terms. Okay. So the first order Born approximation is is to is to do that substitution once and then just keep the first two terms, right? Forgetting about the, you know, even at the end, after you do the substitution, there's still a, a full G at the end, OK? <clears throat> it's recursive. But we're going to stop the recursion right there and, uh, and just take the first two terms of what we've got, <clears throat> OK? So um, um, uh, you know, this is an approximation now. And uh, we've got uh, we've got uh, g naught, so that's the propagation from a source to a uh, to a scatterer, okay? Which is uh, here's the scattering potential l minus l naught, and then the the propagation from the scatterer to the receiver, okay? And then here is the uh, uh, here's the direct arrival from the uh, you know via uh, some kind of bent ray. Um, from uh, <clears throat> there's a direct arrival from the uh, uh, from the source to the receiver, okay, and uh, and that's what we're going to assume now is an approximation to the full Green's function, okay. So the uh, uh, so here's the the this is the scattered wave field, okay, and there's the uh, there's the incident wave field, if you want to call it that. <clears throat> All right. So the the you know geo g naught l minus l naught uh, g. The smaller that scattered wave field is compared to the incident wave field g naught, you know the better this the better the approximation here is. Okay. So we're going to write uh, <clears throat> uh, g uh, under this approximation as uh, G naught plus G naught V G naught, right? And obviously L minus L naught is the scattering potential. And here it is written out, you know, using the definition of L that we had up here on the previous page. Okay, the scattering potential V uh, in the omega domain still is omega squared one over K minus uh, one over K naught. Okay, that quantity plus del dot, and then the quantity. One over rho minus one over rho naught, uh, and th and then there's del again. Okay. <clears throat> now uh, let's take let's build a, a model <clears throat> of the uh, of the scattering potential. Uh, we'll have two model parameters, and uh, we'll we'll just call up. This is what Le LeBras and Clayton do. Um, uh, you take uh, K naught over K, the total K minus one, uh, that's A one. A two is going to be rho naught over rho minus one. So really, this is uh, uh, delta K over K, and A two is is delta rho over rho. All right. So then we can write the scattering potential V as uh, omega squared A one over K naught plus del dot A squared over rho naught uh, del. Okay. So uh, and then here's the Feynman diagrams. Okay, the recorded data. We're assuming this is still an approximation. Okay, it's the direct arrival g naught s plus g naught v g naught applied to s. So there's g naught s, the Feynman diagram for that, um, which I just you know put into a cross section because that makes sense to me. Um, and uh, you know you could make it if you generalized it you could make it look more like a Feynman diagram if you wanted to. And then um, we're adding um, from the source g naught down to the scatterer scatterer the, with the scattering potential v that's at x and z and then another g naught back up to the receiver. Okay. Uh, and I, I hope um, this uh, um, this Lippmann-Schwinger equation makes it clear how the um, 
the scatterer becomes a, a kind of an image source, a virtual source. Right? It's, it's really the, the act of plugging this equation back into itself recursively. That's what, what makes the image source. So now the, the reflection data, d, okay, are now uh, just the, you know, this is the whole, the whole data. Let's just take the reflection, the reflection data. Okay? Assume we're muting out the, uh, the direct arrival. So, um, and that's you know that's so easy to do in time generally that uh, uh, we just you know we have no trouble doing that. Um, the reflection data are just uh, are, are for uh, you know a certain uh, x sub g and x sub s. These could be location vectors in three D space uh, at uh, z equals zero and for all omega, right? And it's um, Let's see. Let me let me start at the source and work uh, work to the receiver. Um, we have s of omega, the Fourier transform of the source wavelet, um, multiplied by g naught, which is uh, uh, from the uh, uh, the location vector of the source x s to well. And here in two dimensions, I've got uh, x and z, the location of the scattering of the scatterer. Okay. And then we have x, s, and z equals zero, so that's from the source to the uh, scatterer. Uh, and then we uh, multiply by the scattering potential that exists at at x and z, which is uh, defined right here. Okay, and um, and then we multiply by another g naught, which carries us from uh, the scatterer x and z up to um, the receiver at x sub g, and it's at z equals zero. All right. <clears throat> now, now the uh, x and z, okay. Um, what uh, what the repetition, right? X and z is there and there and there. What that indicates is integration over their domain over the scattering volume, and that's really the the theory that Kirchhoff put together. Um, you know about what it, what it is that you add up to fully carry the idea of the Feynman diagram, where uh, basically you know a a reflection is created uh, you know can be created anywhere in this uh, volume at different scattering potentials and and with different uh, you know different ray propagation uh, from the sources to the reflector and then back to the receiver. All right. So what this is now, uh, you know, even with all the integration, it's still a you know. So you're adding the integration is basically uh, a bunch, you know turning this into a bunch of summations, right? You've got uh, g v g s uh, for um, you know some exact point x and z, and then right next to that at x plus one and z plus one, you've got another g v g. You add another g v g s, or I'm sorry, g naught v g naught s. And then, at another point, you know, down somewhere else, you add to you add another g naught v g naught s, and you just keep going. Okay, so it's starting to sound familiar, um, in a way. Okay, but it's still a linear relation between the scattering potential and the reflection data. But it's a linear relation, but even with all the summation, it's a linear relationship between the data, the reflection data d, and the scattering potential v. Okay, so uh, we can define uh, uh, where we have constant background velocity. We can do all this in the Fourier domain. Okay, the way we learned how in um, seven oh six. So let's take uh, rho naught and k naught as constants, and we're going to use just the acoustic wave equation here, uh, as we as we did all through. Um, uh, you know both classes so far, um, so we have uh, straight rays, of course, and we can transform. Um, so uh, we can write the the reflection data, um, you know, in terms of kx, uh, case case of x, case of z, and omega. Um, we can write the, them in terms of the Fourier duals of the elements of, uh, of the scattering potential v. 
All right, so we have uh, uh, the data in terms of kg, ks, and omega. You know, these are the uh, the slopes in terms of uh, uh, of the geophone locations, the slopes in terms of the source locations. You know, that are in the data, um, and that's the uh, um, the time frequency. Um, so we have minus uh, this uh, cost that we can factor out here minus rho naught over four. Uh, Q sub S Q sub sub G, okay. We'll get to what those are later. All right. We have omega squared over V naught squared times A one, and A one depends on K X, which is K sub X, which is K sub G minus K sub S. Uh, remember the translation between uh, uh, you know midpoint and uh, uh, and uh, source and receiver locations, right? So this, that works uh, similarly with the um, with the k's, um, with the wave numbers, k sub g is uh, equal to minus q sub g minus q sub s, and then uh, we have this. Uh, the second term of the scattering potential is uh, q sub g times q sub s minus k sub g minus k sub s times a two. Right, a one depends on uh, uh, delta is delta k over uh, k, <coughs> and um, uh, a, A2 is uh, uh, delta rho over rho, uh, and so that's located at uh, um, k sub g minus k sub s, and also uh, minus q sub g minus q sub s, and then all that gets multiplied by the Fourier transform of the of the source wavelet. Now, um, k sub g and k sub s are the source receiver lateral wave numbers. Okay, k sub x's. Okay, what are what are uh, q sub g and q sub s? Okay, um, they're basically the different omega stretches. Okay, uh, this looks a bit like um, uh, Stoltz uh, derivation, right? Um, so uh, q sub uh, zeta uh, is uh, equal to uh, minus uh, uh, omega over v naught, and and as you can see, I'm coming right out of the um, uh, just uh, right out of a, uh, a dispersion relation, one minus v naught squared k sub zeta squared over omega squared. Okay, so k z now is the sum of the two, really. Right? There's uh, there's k z in there. Um, k z is the square root of one minus v naught squared k sub g squared over omega squared plus the square root of the quantity one minus v naught squared times k sub s squared divided by omega squared, and you recognize this. That's the double square root equation. Okay, which again we was easy enough for us to define um, for the uh, um, easy enough for us to define from from the uh, um, uh, for the constant background case. All right. So now uh, we could write it down in, in mid midpoint offset uh, uh, coordinates as well. Um, you know, so we could get the data in terms of k m and k sub k sub m and k sub h midpoint and, and half offset. Uh, it's still omega, and so uh, we have to have this uh, kind of hairy a one factor and a two factor, which depend on k z, k m, k h. Okay, there's the same a one, which now we're locating our um, uh, uh, this is kind of our, our AVO, um, right? This depends on midpoint, depends on offset, depends on where the it depends on where the scatterer is and what the offset is, right? So uh, the A one is going to depend on KM and KH, and A two, which is uh, you know delta rho over rho, that also depends on KM and KH. So the uh, the hairy uh, A one amplitude factor is um, this thing uh, relating kz to uh, kh and km, um, and uh, of course, uh, you know, here's the Jacobians of uh, of the the wave numbers. You know, as you as you might remember, uh, we defined km equal to kg minus ks and kh equal to kg plus ks. Um, you know, kind of the differential, right, of the uh, of the relationship between the offset and midpoint and the uh, G and S coordinates themselves. 
which makes sense because the, the wave numbers are related to the derivative, the spatial derivatives. Okay, and uh, likewise, there's this a two factor. <clears throat> so, with that equation, you can get an inverse algorithm, and uh, Clayton and Stolt um, um, actually uh, did a, a Stolt migration style born WKBJ inversion. Okay. Uh, for acoustic reflection data, that's in geophysics uh, way back in 1981, um, and so the uh, the procedure is uh, is uh, as follows: <clears throat> um, you do a, a 3D FFT of your uh, your reflection data from m h and t to k sub m, k sub h, and omega. You deconvolve out the source wavelet. Uh, which is easy enough to do if you uh, if you know what your source wavelet is. So uh, when it's a correlated vibrator uh, wavelet, that's uh, pretty simple. You um, you do your omega stretch, right? From d is a function of uh, km kh and omega to d is a function of uh, km kh and kz. Okay. Um, and then. Uh, you estimate via a least squares fit over kh. You estimate a1 and a2. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. You you uh, right. I didn't show you equations for little a1 and little a or little a2. Okay. Those get estimated from the data. So what Clayton and Stolt uh, proposed was you. Um, you do a least squares fit, you know, versus kh, right? So amplitude versus offset. Although, of course, this is, you know, Fourier domain offset, k sub h. Do a least squares fit, and uh, and get uh, the uh, uh, the a one uh, versus km and kz, and a two versus km and kz, and then you do. Um, um, uh, then you have uh, uh, what you have then is is a field, you know, estimated by that least squares fit, uh, you know, and, and thus getting rid of the kh, right? You've uh, you've estimated, you know, one um, one section, one Fourier transform section for a one, which is um, uh, k naught over k, and then a and then another one for a two, which is uh, uh, I'm sorry, not at delta k over k, and then a two, which is delta rho over rho. Okay, so then all you have to do is two uh, uh, D inverse FFT each of those, a one and a two. Okay. Um, now, uh, there's a lot of limitations to this method, and and really, you know, Fourier transforming the data is. Uh, uh, not necessarily a great thing to do. The real the real limitation here is that um, you um, um, uh, is is that this only works for straight rays and constant background. And I mean, how often do you have that? I mean, if you have that, if you have constant background, you get everything you need out of um, out of you know the brute stack. Um, you know, or a very simple uh, Kirchhoff migration. So, um, you know, it was hard for them to find a. Uh, um, it was hard for uh, Clayton and Stolt to find uh, data examples that that actually worked for it. Uh, but they did. They're in the paper. Um, what this really did is it it really set the stage. It showed that that you really could um, do an inversion. As a migration, right? This is basically not much more than a Stolt migration, where um, instead of just summing over, um, instead of summing over the h direction or the kh direction, what you're doing is you're uh, uh, you're doing this least squares uh, fits to estimate these uh, model space parameters a1 and a2. Okay. Are you doing that least squares for? For each kh, how are you doing that? So, so you have a three D volume of uh, 
of uh, the omega stretch data, right? Yeah. So you've got uh, D prime, which is in terms of Km and Kh and uh, Kz. So um, uh, again, I, I, I would use an output-based method. Uh, you know, maybe we should try this. It might be kind of fun. Um, you uh, uh, you take a uh, um, uh, so so let's let's work first on the A one section. Okay. So what we do is we um, uh, we loop through all the KMs and all the KZs. Okay, and our we set up our our KM and KZ axes, right? And we loop through all the possible values of Km and Kz, right? So um, at uh, at some particular, you know, inside that that dual loop, those nested loops, we've got uh, one particular value of Km and Kz that we're looking at. Okay. So um, uh, in the in the Fourier transform in the omega stretch data, you know, you have a uh, one value of Km, one value of Kz. All right. Then it's basically a single vector, you know how that changes, how the amplitude, the Fourier amplitude changes with k h, with k sub h, and so, you know they they estimate it by uh, by doing a uh, uh, a least squares fit. Okay, so they they look at the amplitude, the Fourier amplitude of the ve of the vector in the k h uh, direction, right? And they get the slope and the intercept, and and they uh, uh, they put that they that's the the uh, the value that goes in there. Um, so uh, uh, um, you know you could imagine a lot of things that could scramble that process, but uh, uh, you know that's a that's not a bad thing to try. Okay. Uh, right. So that's a good place to uh, to stop then. Um, you know, this Clayton and Stolt paper is a uh, it's it's part way to where we want to go. Um, you know, and it comes simply from from writing, you know, out of the Lippmann Schwinger equation, writing the equation for just the reflection data, and then um, uh, rendering that all in um, uh, along with the uh, uh, this uh, asymptotic assumption, you know, for uh, small delta k over k and small delta rho over rho, um, you know, rendering all that uh, basically is a Stolt migration.